thank you for joining us right here on Parliamentary Agenda here on the National Communications Network. I am your host, Travis Bruce. On this edition of the program, I am joined in studio by the Honorable Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, Gail Teixeira, as we have uh, several discussions surrounding the Natural Resources Fund. We will also be touching on uh, several issues like the confirmation of those persons to the ERC Commission and also the Police Service Commission, among other topical issues which will be discussed at Monday's sitting of the National Assembly. Thank you so much for taking time out to be here, Minister Tisha. Thank you for having me again. Right. I'd like us to begin uh, this edition of the program in talking or putting into context the events which unfolded at the December uh, 29th sitting, that's last year, 2021 of what transpired about some of the disciplinary actions that might be coming out of uh, these actions. Uh, what can we expect to see or how can we see this being treated? Well, the December 29th, um, for I think all of us uh, who had just entered Parliament and all of us who've been there for a very long time, that this was, I think it's the, the worst form of behavior I've ever seen in our parliament and is considered gross, gross misconduct and gross uh, disorder and so gross serious disorder so that it has to, the parliament has to determine whether it will allow this to go unpunished or, and uh, what will it do about it. So January 24th is the first meeting since December 29th. I think the whole country, and it's probably on YouTube, the issue of when the mace was seized by two members of parliament, Miss Annette Ferguson and Mr. Jordan, and also what we didn't see, which was the damage to the control room by another member of parliament, and also then the behavior in the house by the opposition members. So. We have to. We have a number of options open to us, as we meaning we, the National Assembly, according to standing orders, and so the Speaker can call on a Minister of Government to call for the suspension of X number of members. The Speaker can also be willing that the matter go to the Privilege Committee, which he chairs and or the government in its own right could go to the speaker in the assembly and call for ex-members to go to the privilege committee. So there are a number of options. On Monday, one of those will definitely be invoked. I have no idea what the reaction would be. I would hope that uh, in the period between December 29th and January 24th that uh, good sense has prevailed and that uh, the MPs on the opposition side and the AP and new AFC as a coalition, as a party, recognize that there have to be boundaries, there have to be limits, and that the behavior of the MPs was unacceptable. Now, of course, Mr. Harmon is the head of the AP new AFC in terms of the general secretary of that organization, as well as lead the opposition, supported it. And, he, he supported after it happened. He wasn't there. Mr. Norton, who is the head of the PNC, also came out supporting it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on Monday because it will be addressed at the meeting on January 24th. One of those options will be called into play. And that um, we hope that better sense prevails and that those who are in Parliament are... Uh, particularly the opposition members who were participating in all this, will recognize that um, this behavior cannot be allowed to continue. So that that's a big issue um, in the parliament, and the standing orders say that, that this issue of discipline or misconduct <coughs> can be raised at any time under um, after the questions are put by the opposition members. They're normal questions which are in order paper. I mean, the this could have happened on December 29th, where a motion could have been invoked to bring this many uh, matters. But as you know, um, there was no way to even partially get your voice heard 
and so it could not be invoked. And, and you are allowed in Parliament when there's gross serious con misconduct for the Speaker to call on a member, a minister, to get up and name the people, which means they could be disciplined at that very point, as well as the Speaker himself, as he did in the budget debate early in the year, we suspended a few MPs, one or two MPs, uh, for what was it, two sittings or two weeks or whatever it was. So there are powers that the Speaker has as well. Of course, that does not um, preclude any action that the police may or may not take in regards to what was damaged to public property. Mm -hmm. The mace is public property. The control room was public property. And, of course, the assault on a member of staff. These are all issues to do, whether it's held, if it happens in the chambers or outside the chambers. Um, these are matters that I believe the police would have an interest in, and they will determine what action they can take against, against the perpetrators. As you know, one the staff member who was um, on the ground being kicked and called names by another MP, um, he has gone to the ERC, except the ERC, the secretary is there, but not the commission. Mm. So his matter is tabled, they can investigate, and hopefully when a new commission comes in, that they will uh, take up the matter seriously. And so in that regard, for the January, we have um, the issue of discipline, the issue of uh, three bills, the tissue transplant, organ transplant, which is bringing us as a developing country into a whole new arena, area of, of medicine, which we've never been, or never dreamed we would have that uh, possibility to do. So the issue of transplant um, is uh, of human organs and also tissue are uh, important areas of both in terms of uh, options for patients and also of research. And the issue of, we don't have a culture here of don organ donations mm -hmm. in the states they who have. So obviously, this will also require us to develop a culture first of do we want to have a donor registry where, and that's what the law provides for, a registry where you can go and register and if I die, I will donate my eyes, my heart, whatever it is, um, to someone who needs it, and to have a donor bank. So this is putting us into, catapulting us into a hu huge new area of medicine. And of course, we know that in the area of kidney transplants, that many of our people have gone to India to do kidney transplants because of what are genetic commonalities, I guess, I'm not using right scientific words, Whereas many Guyanese who may be in, in the United States or Canada may not be able to get a match based, again, on the demographics and ethnic composition of those countries. So this is going to open up some really interesting areas of training for doctors and nurses and, and with uh, the president's invitation and the, the whole discussion now going on of new hospitals, highly specialized hospitals. This is where this bill is going to link in to those new um, medical facilities we're talking about as well. So it's, it's quite a, it's a very technical bill, but it's also very interesting. We have the power of attorney one, which has been on the agenda since December 13th, and you have the deeds registry as well. So these are all bringing into and trying to regularize the areas of powers attorney and ensuring that people are not abusing the the power of attorney, which has been abused mm -hmm. and is abused. Uh, and so so those three are important. Then we have uh, Minister Ashni Singh. His motion, now remember when we passed the bill on natural resource funds, the, in the, that bill, that act, which was uh, assented to on December 30th, is that there are two committees, the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee, and you have um, the, uh, the other committee. Just let me make sure I'm using the right terms so I don't mix up local content and, um, and as well the 
uh, the local content bill. Yeah. So we have the public accountability and oversight committee section six, which has two representative private sector. Uh, we have a nominee of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. We have three representatives of the religious community. We have two representatives of organizations of labor and we have one, one representative of professions. So the, what the bill didn't say and when it was enacted, it didn't say how do we get this nominee? And before that, the, the Act also points out you can't sit on a committee if you're a political activist, you're a member of parliament, um, and so on. So it is trying to make sure in this committee there is a broad spectrum of representation of our society. So the nominee from the National Assembly, how were we to do this? Now, there were two ways we could have done it. One, to go with a motion to Parliament and say, we're nominating X, Y, and Z. So obviously, this person cannot be an MP because the, the Act prohibits it. So <coughs> in this section, so we could have gone that route and just put her name on the ground and at the House and vote, or, vote for it or against it. The other alternative is the Committee of Appointment, which deals with appointments of many um, commissions, constitution commissions, but also even uh, by the Anti-Money anti Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism Act, provides for the Committee of Appointment to appoint, select and appoint the director of the Financial Intelligence Unit, the lawyer of that body, and the accountant. So Committee of Appointments powers have expanded, its mandate has expanded. So the second option was to go with a motion to Parliament saying this matter should it let the Committee of Appointments select and bring back to the House a nominee. So we chose a second. <coughs> so what Minister Ashley is talking about is this Section 6. So the other representatives who come from religious, uh, private sector, labor and professionals. They will go through their civil society procedures, but the one for Parliament will be where the Committee of Appointment, the motion is asking Committee of Appointment to uh, to deal with this matter and return to the House with a nominee. And there's another committee on the Natural Resources uh, Fund, which deals with the Investment Committee, which is uh, Section 8, where the leader of the opposition ha has the right to name someone to sit on it. Right, and then you have nominees from the private one nominee from the private sector, uh, the parliamentary opposition nominee, and then the three, the president uh, and the minister, have a say in appointing. <coughs> so, so you have a in the natural resources two types of committees, and I don't. I think that um, some people seem to have a discomfort with the private sector. Um, um, I, some people seem to be picking on the private sector for some strange reason. Because if it is a private sector they're accusing of being aligned, are you telling me the labor unions aren't aligned or aligned in different ways? Are the religious organizations unaligned? Are the professional bodies unaligned? Why is it only the private sector is being uh, targeted? And so... I'm not going to defend the private sector, but there's an entity and a, and a community in Guyana as a sector. They have a right to have a say in the development of this country. And that's why the public oversight, this is what's called the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee. The private sector will have, as the parliament nominee, as the religious, etc., have a right to oversight the way in which the expenditures are being dealt with in relation to the revenue from oil. And the investment committee will be dealing with the actual investment and, and areas that the G Act uh, defines. So I'm not, uh, I think that this has been an occasion where the private sector doesn't deserve these attacks. And the attempt to try to say, well, the private sector is aligned to the government. I don't remember these organizations saying anything like this when the private sector may have been aligned to Burnham years ago or to even in the last five years to Mr. Granger. There were those attacks too. There were the issues of which way was the private sector going. The private sector has a right as a community to decide what is in their best interest as a community. 
and therefore if they like a particular government's programs and policies or laws, they have a right to say that. If they don't, then they have a right to say that too. In 2015, the private sector didn't have any problems with Granger, but when the taxes hit people in 2016 and 2017 and they were being hurt, they then felt, how can we survive? And so they responded and they went in 2018 calling for the restoration of the of the um, VAT exemptions, etc., which had been there before under our government. Suddenly at that point, they became not as friendly to the then government as they were before. The fact the private sector has said to the government, we like these policies, there's some areas we need you to do more, and they will ask for more, doesn't mean they're going to get it, but the private sector has a right as, an, as a sector to be dynamic, if we want to have a transformative society, we need the private sector to be a dynamic partner in all of this. We would like the others to be. The religious organizations, the labor, the professional bodies, and that's why they're included in the, in the act as participants, as partners. So I, I think a lot of, I think that there are those in our society who want to intimidate people by targeting them. You know, we, we don't have to always agree with our partners, but we have a responsibility to build our nation, even when we agree to disagree. And, and that is, I think, the thrust of what the National Resources Fund Act is about, and how we can involve other people, include other people. Minister Tashir, you mentioned a point there that I just wanted you to expand <coughs> a little bit more on, uh, having the private sector, the labor unions, etc., yeah. forming part of the NRF, and yes. assisting in greater accountability and transparency. Yes. How deliberate was it to have these varying organizations represented to ensure for this transparency? Uh, we have gone on record before <laughs> the elections, in our manifesto, after the elections. The president's mantra is inclusivity, participation, transparency, accountability, and rule of law. Those words constantly appearing in every single speech the president makes. We are committed in finding a modus operandi in our country, a modus vivendi in our country, that allows us to work on common interests and to yet retain our individuality, to retain our, our, what our positions are without feeling that, you know, um, if you support the PPC government, you're now a traitor, you're a psychophant. This is, we can't get anywhere if that's the view, but that's how people are being intimidated by the opposition. And this is not good for our country. This will not move us forward. And unfortunately, um, that there are persons who were silent for five years. They were silent during the elections. They were silent during the recount. Now they've got a lot of spunk. And it's under the freedom of the PPP. We are the ones that are, we are the ones upholding your right to your freedom of expression. And of course, under the Constitution, you can have the freedom of expression, but you can't vilify, vilify other people. You know, so... And that's the constitution of our country. So the the private sector, I don't think, should be worried about the kind of uh, things you hear in the press, etc. And just get on with being a fully prepared entity, sector, that under the local content has a lot of work to do. They have to bring themselves up in terms of their capacity building. This is a brand new area of oil oil industry. And so they have a, the private sector has an enormous opportunity, but enormous responsibilities, and enormous work to bring our capabilities up as a country. We train people, skill people, the right skill sets, so we can fully benefit from all of this. And I think my, my impression is that the private sector is anxious to do, do this. And so why should we in any way try to second guess them and, and make them less less an important partner as, as they are, mm. you know? Thanks for that, Minister. Uh, I would like us <coughs> to shift gears a bit and talk a little bit about uh, 
PPC, Public Procurement Commission. Yes. <laughs> I know um, on our last conversation, we were talking a little bit about how these persons will be selected. And even before, we saw in the media space that some names were presented, uh, nominations of five individuals. Can you tell us now what is the next step? We have the names of the persons, but what happens? Uh, will this be addressed also at Monday's sitting of the National Assembly? Well, let me just answer the last part first, and that is that um, the PPC made a big, uh, PAC made a big headway this week, and we're supposed to meet Monday to go through the draft, the motion, etc. So that won't be on the agenda uh, this Monday. However, um, if you'd asked me that question on Monday when we finish at 4 o'clock, I would have said to you, I can't give you that information. Mm -hmm. But by 5 o'clock it was out, so I can answer you now. <laughs> um, and just like when we met before, yes. you know, uh, the names were already out, although we had a pact that uh, this was confidential, we wouldn't say anything. So the PAC, this was the same thing, we're not going to say anything outside. Within half an hour, everything is in the media, so I am now I'm not uh, compelled to be quiet. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting, and I thought it would be interesting, the three members from the government, um, <coughs> there is no change in that. The, the two members from the APNU AFC went through some shifts. And so, um, based on, I assume, their internal dialogue and issues as a coalition, um, that the name was Mr. Lucas was changed. They said he withdrew. I haven't seen the letter of resignation, but, um, but they have put the AFC representative, which I, I believe is Diana Rajkumar. So it is Mr. Wickham for Apnu and... Uh, Miss Rajkumar, I believe it is, for the coalition. So they did make change. They did change. Um, and I assume that there were quite a number of discussions of quite great, of a lot of intensity, both within PNC, within the APNU AFC coalition. But we now have five names that, if, if they had not reached agreement on their two names, there was no way you're going to get a two thirds. So I feel much more confident now that we have five names, five. I know the people on our side I'm very proud of. Um, you know, two are young people. One is a female with a very good reputation. All three are men and women of integrity, women of integrity. And therefore I'm very proud of the names that we have put forward. They're not members of the PPP as far as I know. They're not politicians, but they're people of great integrity. And that's what you want. I don't know the other two people personally from the other side. I just assume that they would use the opportunity to put up the best people that's available. But I'm pleased that we reached a point on Monday to reach that we have agreed uh, to the five people the, and that we were going to work on this Monday um, with just finalizing the motion and the report to go to Parliament. So that, cross your fingers, there are no changes between now and Monday coming. Um, just cross your fingers, because things change. Uh, this APNU AFC seems to be having a lot of um, turning and twisting and turmoil. So let's see what goes on. Um, but in the, on the order paper are two ahead of the PPC, two, two constitutional bodies ahead of the PPC in the order. <coughs> we have the Ethic Relations Commission. So the same committee of appointment has to get two-thirds majority, like the PPC, for the list of entities. So the ERC, the Human Rights uh, Rights Commissions, have to go through a two-stage process. The first is the list of entities you're going to consult. That requires two-thirds. Then when you consult with all the NGOs who were approved by Parliament, then you come back with the names the actual names now, for the president to appoint. That's a, a simple majority. So PPC is five names, two-thirds. The rights commissions are two-stage. One list for entities, two-thirds, names, fifth, uh, simple majority. The police service commission 
We have four names there for the Police Service Commission from the Committee of Appointment. We reached unanimity in the committee on both both motions, okay. ERC and Police Service Commission. So again, hope hopefully nothing, uh, as they say, turn the apple cart upside down when we come to vote. Mm -hmm. But that, um, so the Police Service Commission has the four names that have been approved. So those are on the order paper and they will take precedence over the PPC when that adjoins it. So I'm really looking forward to getting those constitutional bodies hopefully passed, um, if possible, before we go into budget, <coughs> if not, uh, when we come out of budget. Mm -hmm. Minister Tishera, what are the implications of not having these commissions in place? And earlier you referenced about the parliament staff who went to the ERC to lodge a complaint. There is a secretary out there mm. still functioning. But the, in the absence of these commissions, what are the real implications? The, the issues are that the secretariat is there to serve the commission. And where the commissions have expired, then the secretary does what a secretary does. They take the things, they have investigating officers who would investigate, who would then make a report that if they were a commission, would go to a commission. But they don't have the power to make decisions which are the mandate of the actual commissioners, the chair and the commissioners. So they are running the day-to-day -day operations of the secretariat. Um, the PPC expired in October 2020, 2019. It has not functioned. Um, the fact that with the PPC we have got through in a matter of a short period of months compared to what was before mm. in 2003 to 2015. It took us that long to get five names that were supported. And we have to thank uh, our now president, Irfan Ali, who was able with Mrs. Lawrence to get agreement in the PAC for the first PPC. We could not get it when we were in government. And in opposition, we got it only because of the two-thirds that we either could give it or not. But they always said they would never give it between 2003 and 2015 because there was a whole issue of who should get three and who should get two. So we have carried out now that they've set the tradition by adopting it when they were in government. It now is very hard to reverse that 3-2 that arrangement, which mm. was there. The PPC, though, by law... What happens, it does not, the president of the PPC now is not really one that is, I think that some people are saying that certain things couldn't happen and didn't happen because there's no commission. Yes, it's true. With the ERC, there are the issues of ethnic discrimination or claims of it. Um, but the process takes time. And that the parliamentarians are not full-time. We don't have um, um, members of parliament who are full-time. All the MPs are part-time, every one of them. And so that, that has its own uh, delays. But also, too, we have to reach consensus. And there's greater pressure to reach the two-thirds. So you take greater time. If it's a simple majority, worse yet in the committee, and you know you have a majority and you have in the committee a majority, and you go to the House, you can take the risk of doing that. But in committees that require two-thirds, there is something about talking about trust and confidence and building agreement. Because I've had the experience with the ERC in 2003. We, we struggled and we struggled and we finally got agreement in the committee, unanimity in the committee in 2003-2004. In the motion was put to the House. Everyone's getting ready to debate. It's on the order paper. And the chief whip for the other opposition, PNC, comes to me and says, we need this to be changed. And I said, I can't. This came from the committee. How do we change this? This is a committee recommendation. Um, and they said, I said, all your members agreed to this. They agreed to the drafting of the motion, the report. No, 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 we're not going to give you the two-thirds. So we tried behind the scenes during the debate to get agreement that failed. And so in 2018, with the IPC, the Indigenous Peoples Commission, that committee, same committee headed by Dr. George Norton, had brought the motion to Parliament. 
we had not been attending because <coughs> of the appointment of Mr. Patterson unilaterally by Mr. Granger as the chairman of GCOM. And so they brought this motion where they reduced the number of Amerindians in the, the Indigenous Peoples Commission. And we said, we're not going to support this. You can't have seven Amerindians on, on the Indigenous Peoples Commission. You reduce it to five. This is not going to be acceptable. You can't do it. And so Dr. George Norton at that point, we hadn't reached the debate yet. It was on the order paper. And he, he agreed. He uh, agreed to withdraw, to, to pause it, sorry. So when we ended in um, 2019, it remained on the order paper untouched because that's a two-thirds. So in committees where you require two-thirds vote, you have to tread carefully and to build trust and consensus. You can't bully your way in there. Mm -hmm. And and people, I think, have to understand that we are, look at the behavior in Parliament in December 29th. Do you think it's easy? <laughs> it's an easy job to get consensus or unanimity so that you have some some assurance not 100%, that when you go on the floor, you're going to get your two-thirds. Yeah. You know, so I mean, the, people have to understand this is politics and we're dealing with human characters, but we're dealing with political parties and in, in particular one that is having a lot of trouble. APNU AFC as a coalition, as distinct from the PNC, um, has, has some issues, as we just saw with the PPC. We had to change a name. For our position was, look, 3-2, you're the opposition. You come with a consensus between you on who you want. We will not interfere with that, except if it's a person who has been charged and before the courts for some something. We will have nothing to say against your two, right? But <coughs> they had to make a change, whatever was the internal dynamics that went on. And so I think when, when I listen, I read some of the things that people say in the media, I, in, in my kindest moment, I think that they're doing it out of ignorance. They don't know about how Parliament operates or some of the laws they're talking about or the standing orders. And in other cases, people just have agendas of their own. You know, but I try to, and I, I hope by this program, we can try to inform people about Parliament and the importance of it. There are many more bills coming, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that the public may be interested in. Um, we have, I think, almost finished uh, finalizing the condominium bill, which is an important bill to do with the condominiums that uh, are going to be built but were built under the former government and people can't get loans from the banks because there's no nothing in our laws that allow for that. Mm. So we had to come with a new law to do with condominiums so that people who ne who did buy into those condominiums that or what do you call them, townhouses that were built under the former government so they can access banking, insurance and stuff like that. <coughs> but also in terms of investments that are waiting but cannot do that because there's no legal framework for condominiums in Guyana. There's a Combating of Trafficking in Persons Act, which has been waiting to be sent in. We have a number of rectifications to do with a number of the bills that were passed before. Um, you know that the High Purchase Bill, which went to a select committee, they should start meeting back soon. And then um, Minister Nandalao called a meeting yesterday of the Narcotics Special Select Committee, which is doing with increasing the amounts that you could have on you for personal use. And so to try to reduce the number of persons being sent to prison for having a very small quantity on them. Mm -hmm. And so th those bills are important. The higher purchase bill is important for people in our country. It's been long. It has been... A, I, I cannot comprehend... Why it has been so difficult, because I was not part of um, the drafting of that or the, the involvement of the discussion on that, but it has been a bill that's really necessary. It has been desired for a long time, and I'm glad we're, we will 
<coughs> that is before a select committee, and I think that the public and others need to look at it so that um, they will know what their rights are, because it will give them certain protections that they right now don't have. Uh, we have other bills that um, the Bail Act, for example, I'm sure Minister Nandalal has spoken about some of these things. We have to do a number of amendments to the Anti-Money Laundering and Countering Financing of Terrorism Act. Um, so there, there, there are a lot of bills coming. We will have during the budget, once the budget starts, and Minister of Finance reads the budget, we will then go into debate. So that's there's no other business when the budget starts, the debate starts. We have five days of debate. And then you have the estimates where you're going through line by line, as you know. That's uh, three days or whatever is the time. So until that's finished and the bill, uh, the appropriation bill passes for the budget, then you wouldn't be dealing with some of these other matters until you finish that. So when a budget is going on, that takes precedence over everything else. Yeah. So we're hoping that the, this, the sitting on Monday will get through these issues out of the way. <coughs> and hopefully we can reach the, the, the constitutional bodies. If not, it will roll over to the next sitting. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Minister. <coughs> Uh, of course, you're coming down to program time. Uh, yes, I you know. reference uh, some of these things that we can expect or citizens can yes. look forward to in terms of bills. But uh, specifically, your plan for the year, or the government's plan for the year regarding parliamentary affairs and governance, can you give <laughs> us some insight into that? What can Guyanese expect? What can we be comforted in or our expectations for 2022 as we close out this program? Um, as I said before, we're not the sexy ministry that gets to open bridges and open roads and open houses and open schools, health centers. Unfortunately, mm. we deal with uh, software, backdoor, back, back street software kind of thing. So if I can get the government business on the floor in a timely and efficient manner and to move the bills we need to get through, get the government business through the parliament, then that is our job, to make sure that as smoothly as possible that we can get the government bills through, the motions through, the committees are functioning, our part people are participating in the committees, etc. In the governance areas, of course, there are many areas, both at the international level with our treaty responsibilities, as well as stakeholder issues. And so a number of the areas of stakeholder participation particularly when we are going to be dealing with uh, some of the more controversial bills that come up, as well as uh, electoral reform and later on constitutional reform. But we are going to be having in our own ministry a number of training programs to do with the human rights conventions, which we signed, and we continue training on the anti-corruption uh, conventions and procedures, and to uh, get the various... Um, agencies in the government sector to be properly trained and cognizant of what the responsibilities are and um, what the laws provide for. So they are areas that uh, even in terms of strengthening some of our you know stores rules and other rules that need to be upgraded. So we're, we're the body behind that uh, tries to see how things are moving smoothly and to also where there are gaps, and uh, if it has not been noticed by my other colleagues, and we notice it, that we would then be able to say to the president or cabinet, we have an issue here. So the governance issues in terms of making sure the people benefit and that we are always acting on behalf of the people who put us there. So there may be areas that come up from time to time that have to do with accessibility, or that um, government has a very good program, we're doing X, Y, and Z, but somehow people in this area are not hearing, <coughs> hearing about it, they don't know about it, they don't know what to do. Okay. So those are those softer areas of governance that we get involved with. Okay. And sometimes I may be seen to be putting my finger in too many pots. 
<laughs> that don't belong to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister Tashira, for taking time out to be here, uh, putting into context what we can expect at the 35th sitting of the National Assembly. Yeah. They're happening on Monday, the 24th of January, right. there in the Dome of the Artichon Conference Center. So thanks for being here. I hope you'll be there. Yes, I will. <laughs> and thank okay, you. Thank you very See much. See you, our listeners and viewers of this thank program you. of Parliamentary Agenda. I'm Travis Bruce. Thank you for joining us.